Hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Isabel and yes, today is the last video of the back to school series. Thank you so much for coming along with me. In today's video, we're going to talk about annotating books. I left this topic towards the end because I feel like it concerns also my regular viewers that just come for the book recommendation videos, but they're also very interested about how I annotate. I feel like we need to thank TikTok, or at least that's what I see in my For You page, for this new interest in how people annotate because we show books there, because people see others marking, and they become increasingly more interested in. With that being said, I know that there's many people out there who think of the idea of annotating a book as disrespecting it, and they are very strict and very clean and very respectful of the book that they just never touch it beyond reading or they're very careful when they even open it and all of that, which I want to say, if this is you, I understand. I feel like it's a very human response because we prize books, because we think of them as very valuable objects and especially when we don't have a lot of money for them and we get them very sporadically. So it feels like a treat that we really need to take care of or because they come from a place of a lot of love and we want to cherish them. I understand all of this and I understand that a lot of people might also see annotating as a chore. My understanding about the American education system a lot of you had the experience that when you were in high school or middle school, the professors would require you to annotate and you had to show the annotations. So it does feel like out of school. However, I've always had a very different approach. I don't know why, but since I was little, I like annotating books. Sometimes I would finish the book, if that makes sense. If I didn't like the ending, you know how at the end there's like a few pages left. I would write a different ending or I would stick a few pages there to change something. I felt like the book is there for me to talk to and to converse with it. So at the margins, that's where I put my comments. I like flipping back and seeing what I thought or the pages that I highlighted, things that caught my attention. And that's for the books I read for fun. But for the books I read as an English major in my master's, it's very much the same process. Because I need to engage with this book critically and I need to remember things for class. And when I'm in class, I need to flip back then that's when I find that annotating is super useful. All of the English majors that I've ever met annotate in some form, the professors. If you want to be a poll, if you're one of those people that are very against writing in books, look at an English professor's book. Those things are barely readable anymore. Like so many times that they have taught that course that everything is marked. I think that they're the most precious books ever. And I feel like after you start engaging with a book like that, it kind of becomes addictive and it becomes part of the reading experience in a way that not annotating would be like not fully having read or fully have understood the text. So those are the reasons of why you should annotate, right? What or why do I annotate? But you might be wondering, well, how do I start? What do I even write? And the thing is, you can write whatever you want because they're just for you. No one else is gonna come and put them to a test to see how useful they are, how smart you are, how intelligent you become by just write, by reading your annotations in the margins. What I like to do in the margins is to annotate and mark what I find interesting. And when I say interesting, I mean something that I would like to go back to and do a close reading of that passage or that I found especially appealing because it talks about a topic or it's like, I don't know, a social response to something else or because I find it that is written beautifully. Sometimes we just want to mark a passage that is beautiful to recognize it. It's when you see a beautiful person on the street and you give them a compliment. Like you don't mean anything by it and you're not gonna get anything out of it other than the satisfaction of acknowledging it. If you're in a class or if you do re book reviews online, you can mark parts that you want to come back to or that they're going to be very salient in your review. So let's say that you are reviewing a book about terror and you're marking the parts that make you freak out the most or if romance, the most beautiful parts where you feel like romance is very well done there. Or if you're writing an essay or for a class, you mark passages of things that you might utilize for your essay, for your exam, for your class discussion. So like the short answer of what you should annotate is whatever that comes to your mind, whatever you find interesting. And I refuse to believe what I've seen in some people's comments when they talk about this, like, oh, I don't find anything interesting or I don't have anything to say. 
I don't know why people keep saying like, oh, I read something and I don't have anything to say. Of course you do. You're reading it. Like, <laughs> you're a person. You have your own experience. You have your own ideas. And if you're a way of saying, I have nothing to say because I find it good, just mark it because you find it good. Now I grab a few books from my bookshelf to show you how I do it or specific things that I do. All of these were read for classes, but the way annotate, I annotate books for classes are the same way that I annotate books for fun. So that's why I'm not having a specific difference between them. And I have other types of annotation in older books. Like you, I could show you the way that my annotation style has evolved, but all of those books are back in Mexico in my parents' house. So these are just recent books from last semester. We're gonna start with Rayuela by Julio Cortázar. Uh, this is in Spanish. If you know anything about Rayuela is that it's famous for its messy structure. It is conceived like that. What I mean with messy structure is that you don't read it chronologically. I mean, you could like after chapter one, after two and three, but at the end of each chapter, let me locate one. At the end of each chapter, you will see here, for example, minus 71. This means that after chapter four, you need to go read chapter 71. Here, there is a table of how this jumping back and forth goes. And you can also read it chronologically, as I said. For class, the first read we did was chronologically and then we did the jumping. So for my first read, on top of the annotating, the page marking, the highlighting, the writing on the margins, all of that good stuff that I do for every other book. I have post-it notes where I summarize my thoughts on that section and in my dump notebook that I told you about before. I had uh, notes on each chapter. Most of them are summaries of what happens in each chapter. Each chapter can connect in different ways within one another so I need to be really sure what happens in each. So I have chapter two, chapter three, four, five and just notes of what happens. Little summaries, sentences, but as I was progressing in my reading and I was noticing patterns and important things for me, I start writing down a little quote that I wanted to go back to so I remember what chapter it belonged to or what it might mean. I start picking on themes and writing them down. And then when I would go to my seminar class, we would start with discussion and every this I could flip to my notebook and see the important parts that I wanted to discuss. This is something that you can do with every book with every class, of course, it makes your reading slower. You are writing all of this, but it also makes it richer. And that's something that I need to prioritize. I, or at least as a reader, I always try to prioritize absorbing as much of the book as I can and digesting the book as much as I can, even if it takes me longer than just consuming, consuming, consuming literature, just because. I like taking my time with it. I like going through it. I like close reading. I like thinking. I like writing. I like doing all of those things. So having these types of notebooks or just notes, it could also be done in Notion or whatever note taking app that you use. And having those to come back to is very important to me. And I find that once you start doing this, it's very enriching. Now, this is my copy of Middle March. This is my second copy of Middle March, actually. And each time I reread a book, I find that sometimes I annotate and I mark the same passages because I keep gravitating back to them even if I didn't remember them at the top of my head. But also I notice different things. I know that you're going to ask, Isabel, what do the colors mean? They don't mean anything. Just, it's the order that the post-it notes come in. Like, I start for green and I go like this and then I go back to green as I go by it. I don't know why. I used to create a color coding system for each book that I read and I would have that it made it like mean different things if I was tracking different motifs or themes or characters and all of that. But I found that very complicating because at the end of the day, I just need a piece of paper to go back to it and then I know what it means. I just, I, I have that memory, I guess, when I know what it means and what am I going, like if I'm looking for something, I remember what color the post-it note end up being. And again, you can see my style is very similar. I highlight, I underline, I mostly underline and I only highlight very important things. And if there is a highlight underline combo, then we are here for like something very interesting. And if it has like a big commentary underneath, very interesting for me, apparently. So the margins, I like Penguin's editions because they have big margins or at least big enough for you to write on. 
And here we have an example of two color highlighters. What does it mean? I give myself a color for highlighting. So for example, let's say that for middle March, I'm yellow. My professor is orange. So every time I bump into an orange part, that's something that my professor pointed out. This is very important for me as a student because when I come back, I can see what were my ideas and what were my professor's ideas or my classmates. And if you have an exam or if you have you need to come up with topics, then you can come back and see what the professor alludes to. So that might be in the exam or that might be a good topic to write about according to their personal views. Now, the top of books I reserve for reading sessions. When I have a book assigned to me for reading, I divide how many pages there are and how many days I have for reading them. And then let's say I have 20 pages per reading session. So 20 pages a day so I can have the reading done. So here we can see uh, this is one session, this is another session. So the top, those are the reading sessions. Sometimes I write the day that they have to be completed, but because I do it every day, it's just like, whatever, I just flip back. And when I get to the point that I hit the top page flag, then I know I'm good to put it down and continue a different reading. For example, if I go to the beginning, I still have the post-it note of the calculations I made. Middle March is 838 pages. So if, and I had 26 days to read it. So that's how this division worked. Because I have multiple classes, that means that I need to read multiple books at the same time. So let's say if I have five classes, then I'm probably reading five novels or five different books at the same time. Therefore, I change the colors of highlighters that I use for each book. How do I do that? I don't know. I have my favorite colors. Sometimes I use my favorite colors and sometimes I use the class color and sometimes I match with the cover, whatever it is. I just make sure to be consistent and to at the front of the book, sometimes I have like of which color I am and which color is my professor, but it's usually very apparent because the one that comes the least is the professor because we don't go over everything. And like almost every page has a highlighter belonging to my personal voice. This is Vanity Fair. This is also a book that I read for a class. Same thing happens here. Something that happened to me in Vanity Fair is that I was highlighting with greens and different shades of green, depending on themes. Um, I don't have a key anymore, but they all make sense to me. Like the dark green was relationships and the light green was social commentary. Same case to the top, those are the reading sections. And for example, I don't have um, the Jane Austen books that I use for my Jane Austen seminar, but for my Jane Austen seminar, at the end of each chapter, I will have a big post-it note with a summary. So if you don't want to do it in the brain dump notebook, or if you don't want to do it in Notion, you can also do it directly to the book, either writing there or with a post-it note that summarizes it. The thing with the post-it notes or with the notebook is that at the end you can just look at them and then you see the skeleton of your novel. That is useful if you're interested, in, for example, in narratology and how novels work, or for example, in that class that we had all of Jane Austen's novels, we could see how they were similar to one another, looking just at the structure, how long the paragraphs are, how long the chapters are, when does the main character get introduced, when does the twist happen, all of that. You are looking into an author's entire body of works. It might be a bit overwhelming if you might forget key moments that might be interesting for analyzing before. As I said, I'm sorry I don't have it here, but yes, a post-it note at the end of each chapter with the summary or the notebook as I showed for Rayuela is very important for, for this type of classes. For example, I'm reading Jane Earl for like fifth time or whatever. I have no idea how many times Jane, I read Jane Earl and I'm reading it because I want to use it for my thesis, but I'm just reading it on my own, on my own time. This is my reading session, how I divided it. I have way more bigger post-it notes all over the place, popping out here and there, not at the end of the chapters. And that is why, because I'm thinking of a thesis already, I have a lot of longer thoughts that I need to write down that it might not be possible in the margins. It's funny because Jane Eyre is one of my favorite books and this copy is gonna look like not as annotated as it could be because I have other two copies of Jane Eyre that are heavy annotated. So a lot of the things and thoughts I know that they're already down, so I didn't write them down. I tried to keep this as my thesis copy and the notes that I put in my margins are related to fire. Why fire? Because I'm gonna write about fire. The time that I came across the word 
fire, Arden or any imagery of fire in relation as well with female characters, it comes in orange. So every time I flip over this book and I find an orange quote, I already know it's going to be about fire compared to the yellow ones that are just in about content. Now quickly, let's talk about what do you need for annotation. Post-it notes, page flags, and bigger ones. I usually go with these little guys and this for the chapter summaries, but the ones that I cannot live without are the page flags. Now let's think highlighters. These are my outliners and these are Stabilo, but it could be any brand you want, any thickness you want, etc. I want to especially talk about my outliners because of English majors. If you're an English major, you know that sometimes the anthologies and the type of paper that they use for the books that you buy is very cheap because they're student editions. That's the way of the publishing house to cut costs but still include the notes and all the things that we like. So I feel like you never go wrong with this brand, the Zebra Might Liners. I've used them since I'm in high school and I bought two packages since. So, and, and I am a heavy annotator, so they have last a long time. And why I talk about this markers, even though some people think that they're overhyped, is because they don't go through or they don't bleed as much in this type of cheaper papers. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's their formula or what, but they come in a wide variety of colors. I don't believe that they're that expensive or difficult to get as once they were. Like once you could only get them from Japan and you had to order them through sketchy websites. Now you can buy them at Walmart. So we come a long way finally. And I feel like you never go wrong with those. The Stabilo might be a hit or miss. You might like them, you might not like them. They do bleed heavily, especially when you first buy them. Like They come with a lot of ink, but I have never run out of one. They're a solid brand that you can get almost anywhere as well because they come in a wide variety of colors. It's very easy also to color code if you want and keep track of motifs, themes, characters, etc. Now I want to talk about pens because yes, I annotate with pen. These are my favorite three pens that I mostly use for annotating. First is a Stabilo or Stabilo. I don't really know how you pronounce that, but it's a fine liner, black, excellent, but it kind of bleeds through. So I need to do a few page testers before I commit to it, but I mostly use this. I also really like writing with Pigma Microns, especially for the Northern anthologies because it doesn't bleed through and you can write and then put the highlighter and it doesn't smear, it's amazing, but they are a bit pricier. That's why I stopped using them for annotating and now I only use them for my bullet journal, but they're a very good choice if you have a bigger budget. But my favorite pen is the Paper Mate Inkjoy. I like that the ink is very black and it's a bit thicker. I usually stick to the finer points, but I don't know why I really like how my handwriting looks with this. It's very comfortable to write with this. They're kind of cheap. So for me, this is the best pen ever. When I think about color, because I write in colors as well and I underline with colors, you can also, your cheapest option is also just buying like the paper mate, basic ones that they're ballpoint. If you use ballpoint pens, you're never going to have that issue of bleed through. It, they just don't look as vibrant as one might like but they're also solid options. Or you can get something like this that I recently got that has like four colors and you can just bring it with you so you don't have to bring many pens and you can just And I also have the mini Stabilo. I would like to get the big ones. I have this one since 2016 and there are, a lot of them are running dry. I really need to get rid of them and replace them, but I, they are, have a piece in my heart. Uh, but similar deal with the black version. They do tend to bleed through if you're writing on cheaper paper, but the ink is brighter. So if you like that type of brightness in your colorist, I would recommend getting them. The mini versions are very versatile, easy to bring with you, and they have lasted me for a long time, and I've used them a lot, so it was a good investment. But that's about it. With If you watch my blog of one week uh, studying in Mexico remotely in a Swiss university, you will see that my desk at my parents' home has a lot of pants. I own a lot of stationery back then, but these are the ones that I decided to bring with me here. So that should tell you that those are my basics and those are my favorites. Still, if you might think that you would like to start annotating, but you're not ready to commit to pens, you can use a mechanical pencil or regular pencil and just 
right very lightly and if you feel like you regret it you can erase it anytime you want there's also transparent post-it notes that i haven't tried yet but i saw them at the store and those could be great especially for borrow books from the library but like so the post-it note doesn't cover the text but you can have it there and write on top and underline or highlight i think that that i should get those and if those could be a good option to you as well if you are transitioning into not annotating to fully annotating i highlight i underline i use page flags i write a summary after each chapter of complicated big text and this is my biggest asset to be prepared for school to come in and be hermione granger be rory gilmore because i can just flip back as i've said in my video of organization i do my readings one week ahead so it's not like i read it last night before class so I, that also helps me to keep them fresh and it's so ingrained into my DNA that every time I read something I already have something on my hand to annotate it it is weird the text that I don't annotate it doesn't matter what it's about I just do it automatically and i feel like that has increased my critical thinking skills and is part of my reading ritual if you have any questions leave them down below please do not leave me a comment saying that i ruined my books i don't care and i'm not being mean to you so don't be mean to me next week we go back to regular programming keep reading and when you're not follow me on all my social media link down below and find me everywhere as isabel's digest i'll see you next week bye